Police are still looking for a man who stabbed a pregnant woman and her boyfriend this morning in Grand Forks. Police say he could be dangerous and you should make sure you lock your doors tonight. The victims tonight share their story exclusively with Valley News Live about how they survived what they say was a random attack. I had nothing to protect myself with other than my fists. One of the victims of the double stabbing Monday morning is home safely. Saw her walking down the hallway bleeding, just bleeding out. Gonzalez is describing his pregnant girlfriend. It all started this morning. And she went to go open the door and there was a, a skinny gentleman at the door staring at her with no, nothing but just hate and just decided to start throwing a, a knife into her stomach and her chest. He says the man they'd never seen before started attacking. Seen him throw her on the floor and was trying to grab her and I just came up and tackled him. That's when the assailant turned the knife on him. After I get him off and, you know, fought him off of her, she came chasing after me and I jumped off the balcony. He says he shattered his wrist and messed up his knee. Meanwhile, he gave his girlfriend enough time to flee to the neighbors. She showed up at my doorstep, bleeding. She made it downstairs. Her neighbor helped stop the bleeding from her neck. The moment that it really struck me was when her eyes were rolling back and she looked at me and asked me if she was going to die. She didn't. I just got told by the victim's boyfriend that I held pressure long enough and hard enough that it formed a clot in her neck to keep her from dying. As for the baby? It's a boy, Gabriel Paul. Six months along, despite the trauma this morning, gratitude, his family is still intact. It's a, it's a bad Monday, but you want to know what? I'm grateful that I'm here on this Monday. They're all expected to make a full recovery as police turn their attention to catching the man responsible. From Grand Forks, Ryan Laughlin, Valley News Live. And police are still asking for your help to track down the man who attacked Gonzalez and his girlfriend. They describe him as a Hispanic man in his mid-20s, just over six feet tall, and had a bald or shaved head. He is considered potentially dangerous, and police are urging people to keep their doors locked, even if they're home. If you have any information, they're asking you to call police at 701-787-8000. Coming up after weather, we now know the funeral arrangements for Savannah Grayland. Plus, rallies are being held this holiday for higher wages. But first, Robert, we saw some interesting weather on this Labor Day. Wind, rain, hail, and cooler temperatures. Yeah, a very active day today, but right now, as we take a live look outside on the Coronado.com Valley Skycam, part of the Storm Team Skycam Network, looking off towards the southeast, then a bright moon rising into the sky. Most of the cloud cover that we had earlier has gone by the wayside, but Temperatures continue to take a nosedive. 57 degrees out there, but thankfully the wind's much lighter than they were earlier. They're going to stay relatively light tonight, but they're going to pick up again as we head through your Tuesday. Right now, temperature-wise, mostly in the 50s, but still 60 degrees in Jamestown and 61 down in the Gwinter area. And we're about to drop down into the 40s. Over in Bemidji, current temperature of 50 degrees. Winds, again, much lighter than they were earlier. Light tonight, but then they'll pick up tomorrow. Some gusts tomorrow over 30 miles per hour. A lot of the cloud cover that has dissipated as we've gone through the evening hours tonight as well as the precipitation that we had. Most of that long gone. Still a few very small sprinkles down near the Sisseton area. A few more showers making their way into Lake of the Woods County. And you may see some isolated showers overnight tonight up in northern portions of Minnesota. But a lot of those should dissipate over the next few hours. Northern Plains relatively quiet outside of a few isolated showers and sprinkles. A few showers and storms are on the southwest, a one severe storm in extreme western portions of Arizona and still some severe weather ongoing in parts of the Great Lakes. A couple of severe thunderstorm watches continue. One severe thunderstorm warning in northwestern Ohio. Out in the Atlantic, Irma has continued to intensify. Now a Category 4 hurricane with peak winds of 130 miles per hour. Right now moving off towards the west at around 13 miles per hour. 450 miles from the Leeward Islands right there. Hurricane warnings in this area. Hurricane watches over in the San Juan, the Puerto Rico area. And as we go through time, anticipated the track generally off towards the west northwest and then take a right turn. And where that right turn happens is going to play a big part. It could turn out to sea. It could hug the east coast of Florida. It could go right through Florida. So a lot of question marks remain as to where Irma ends up. For us, though, overnight tonight, some quiet conditions as we head through the overnight hours. Across the far north, a few isolated areas could get down cold enough for a little bit of light frost. And as we head through the day tomorrow, more cloudiness to the east, less cloudiness to the west, maybe an isolated sprinkle or shower in our eastern counties as well. Tomorrow night, even chillier, a better chance for some frost, especially 
across our northern counties. Here in Fargo, we start off your Tuesday in the 40s by lunchtime in the low 60s. And not going to get a whole lot warmer than that with some strong and gusty north and northwest winds. Picture of the day, a hazy Lake 7 sunset in Frazee. Thanks to Sarah for sending that in. Going to use that as the backdrop to our seven-day forecast. And a lot of sunshine as we head through the next few days, but chilly over the next couple of days. By the end of the week, they'll be getting back into the upper 70s, 80s over the weekend with just a small chance for a few showers and storms late Sunday and early on Monday. I just cannot get over that we're going to see the 40s and have it be so chilly. For Ugh. me, that's great sleeping weather. I love the 40s. I, I do even too. love the 30s even better. But <laughs> let's just, okay, <laughs> yeah. let's take it easy. All right. Okay, <laughs> we'll stick with those 80s that are on the board. There you go. Thanks, Robert. You got it. Well, we've got an update on a story we've been following for you the past few weeks. We now know the plans for Savannah Graywin's funeral. Service will be held this Thursday, September 7th at 10.30 a.m. at First Assembly Church in Fargo. This announcement follows an outpouring of community support for the Graywin family after tragically losing Savannah. According to the Savannah LaFontaine Graywind official Facebook page, a local couple offered to donate a custom headstone for the Graywind family. Also, the Fargo North football team just held a Miracle Minute fundraiser, collecting over $1,200 for the U.S. Bank Fund in just one minute. We're also following a developing story in Fargo. A concerned parent reached out to us on our whistleblower hotline about a special education teacher being attacked at their child's school. Now, the teacher ended up being diagnosed with a concussion. School official Anne Marie Campbell tells Valley News Live a teacher got a concussion while working with a student at Carl Ben Eilson Middle School last Friday, but cannot tell us if it was a special education student involved in the incident. Teacher safety was one of the main reasons contract negotiations stalled between teachers and the Fargo School Board up until two weeks before this school year started. The final contract teacher signed did not add any language on guaranteeing a teacher's right to safety. And if you need help uncovering fraud and corruption in your community, call us on our whistleblower hotline. As mentioned, that story previously came to us through that, so if you need help, call 701-237-6576 and leave your tip. A member of our investigative team will get on the case and go to work to expose the truth. A man convicted of killing two people in Fargo is set to be sentenced tomorrow. Ashley Hunter was found guilty on two counts of murder and one count of arson. This after Clarence Flowers and Sam Trout of Fargo were killed in 2015. Hunter pleaded not guilty in court, but was convicted of murder for the two deaths and arson for trying to burn down the house of Sam Trout in an effort to cover it up. The sentencing hearing is set for tomorrow morning at 1030. West Fargo police say it is the biggest drug bust they've had in a long time, maybe ever. Officers stopped a car on I-94 for a traffic violation and take a look. They ended up finding illegal drugs that they say are worth more than $700,000. The officer had his canine partner check the vehicle out. That resulted in a search which turned up 125 pounds of marijuana and other drugs in the car. Police identify the driver as Hans Wagner from California. He is in the Cass County Jail charged with delivery of marijuana. Some people are asking when will another construction project impacting thousands of drivers be done? The 32nd Avenue project is expected to be completed by October. Today, no work was being done, but movement on the project is visible. The city of Fargo says drivers will soon see the south side of the intersection on 39th Street to reopen in both directions. Some of the interstate ramps are still closed and traffic over the bridge is still down to one lane as well. The speed limit on 32nd Avenue is still reduced to 25 miles per hour and 45 miles per hour on I-29. Meanwhile, another busy Fargo intersection will see changes starting tomorrow as road work preparations begin. The intersection of 13th Avenue and 25th Street will see reconstruction of the intersection to improve the surface. The city of Fargo says the area has lots of potholes and preventative maintenance will no longer work. Drivers should expect delays and plan accordingly. The intersection will stay open, but lanes will be reduced. The first phase starts next week and the intersection will be done in sections. It's become very common over the last several years, people protesting on Labor Day for higher wages. It happened all over our country today. This was a Labor Day rally in the Twin city Cities where they're hoping to get a $15 an hour minimum wage. Even though people are fighting for 15, several studies have been published that say the minimum wage 
should be over $20 by now to keep up with the cost of living. Now, right now, the federal minimum wage is $7.25. And back in our area, there were no rallies, but people were, of course, working. Valley News Team's Cornelius Hawker went to a few places we can expect to be open not just on Labor Day, but almost all holidays. He shares with us what they had to say about working today. I can grab this out of your way for you. Kara Jacobson, like so many other people, walked in this Labor Day. It's been a busy day. We've already had a couple of parties come in, so it's been a good one, though. For hundreds of thousands of Americans, working on federal holidays is just part of their job. Strawberry leaf? Yeah. yeah. Okay, go for a pint. Pardon me? Go for a pint? Yes. Okay. Aaron Templin, one of the owners of Front Street Tap Room, yeah. says people in certain industries yeah. know they're going to be working on holidays. In the food and beverage industry, you don't really see Labor Day as a holiday. Um, you just kind of figure you might have to work. There's just a lot of restaurants, bars that need to be open. People want to go to them. But people in those industries expect you to realize this. I think it's important to remember that a lot of people would rather be spending time with family, but they're here instead, maybe because they have to work. They didn't really have a choice. So it's really nice to understand that maybe if you're in this industry, maybe tip a little bit extra on holidays. It doesn't have to be much, but it's kind of nice to know that people still care. Cornelius Hawker, Valley News Live. On the subject of working, a new survey says that workplace safety is the top concern for most people when they're looking at a place to work, beating out wages and benefits. But the study also found that people only really pay attention to safety when there's serious workplace accidents and injuries. Participants said that stress was a big co contributor to workplace accidents, with 13% of them saying that their job is always stressful and another 21% saying their work is often stressful. Veterans from a local organization are going above and beyond to help Harvey victims. The Fargo-Moorhead-based group, The Fallen Outdoors, is a nonprofit focused on helping veterans of all kinds get involved with the outdoors as a way of coping with a number of issues. Now, they're taking their sending, they're sending their support to Harvey victims with $5,000 in supplies and more than a dozen volunteers. They went to help out any way that they could and spent days driving back and forth Members did everything from getting supplies to those in need to looking for stranded residents in hard hit areas. With Labor Day coming and going, Minnesota schools are now set to start classes again for the year. Empty schoolyards and classrooms here in Moorhead will be bustling with activity for the new school year. Minnesota state law prevents schools from starting before Labor Day, so tomorrow will be the first chance for kids to get back into classes.